All right, good. Uh, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, being here today. Glad you stuck around. Uh, my name is Lee Reiners, and I am the Executive Director of the Global Financial Market Center uh, here at Duke Law. Uh, today's event is uh, very timely, not only because a hurricane is a perfect metaphor for what happened. Um, you, stole, you stole my oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Well, I'll, you can use it again. Okay. Um, but it's also timely because uh, 10 years ago, uh, this coming Saturday, uh, marks the failure of Lehman Brothers, the uh, largest bankruptcy in U.S. history. Uh, Lehman's bankruptcy further plunged the financial industry and the American economy into the worst crisis since the Great Depression. So we are very fortunate to have Lawrence Ball with us today to revisit the government's fateful decision to let Lehman Brothers fail. Mr. Ball is Professor of Economics and Department Chair at Johns Hopkins University and author of The Fed and Lehman Brothers, Setting the Record Straight on a Financial Disaster. And I saw that we are, there are some books uh, for sale outside the, the lecture hall. Uh, Professor Ball is also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a consultant for the International Monetary Fund. He has previously been a visiting scholar at a number of central banks, including the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of England, and the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Ball to Duke. Thanks, Lee. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I was going to say that uh, since you're here, uh, I probably don't need to give too much background. I assume that you're familiar with the topic and find it fascinating. Now that I know there's free pizza, maybe you don't have to raise your hand. Some of you may uh, not really care so much. I don't know. But anyway, I, I still won't give too much background uh, because, um, uh, again, the 10th anniversary of the Lehman failure has been in the news a lot. Um, so the, the bare bone facts are that uh, over the course of 2008, both before and after September 15th, uh, the Federal Reserve and the government stepped in to rescue many financial institutions that otherwise would have gone bankrupt, uh, the most famous probably being Bear Stearns and AIG, and that there was this shocking event on September 15th of Lehman Brothers declaring bankruptcy. Shocking because it was the largest bankruptcy in U.S. history. Uh, it was a firm which the year before had been named by Fortune magazine uh, the number one most admired securities firm in the United States. Um, and it was shocking because it was unique, because it was the one firm uh, that, that wasn't rescued that had to file a Chapter 11 bankruptcy petition. Um, and then, um, so, so understanding why the Fed didn't rescue Lehman is important. Uh, because of, as I summarize in a sentence, uh, the aftermath for the financial system and the economy uh, in the decade since. Actually, uh, one question that a lot of people have discussed, and we'll never know the answer, is how different would history have been if the Fed had rescued Lehman Brothers? I am probably on the side of saying if Lehman Brothers had re been rescued, the whole financial crisis would have been more contained uh, the whole Great Recession would not have been as, as severe. Millions of people might not have lost their jobs. We can talk about that. We'll, we'll never really know, obviously, that counterfactual history. What I will emphasize is what actually uh, did happen in the days leading up to the Lehman bankruptcy, why the decision was made to let it fail. And since that's something that actually did happen in history and there's a lot of evidence about it, uh, I think we can be pretty definite about that. Um, okay. Um, uh, by the way, I'd like to have this be as informal as possible. Rather than have a Q&A session at the end, uh, feel free to interrupt or I may stop and solicit questions. Uh, if, if I don't get through everything, uh, that will be just one more reason uh, why it's imperative to buy the book. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so <clears throat> uh, why wasn't Lehman uh, rescued? So. For the last 10 years, many, many people have weighed in, oh, it's obvious why Lehman wasn't rescued, although the reason it's obvious is different depending on who you talk to. Um, uh, many people say, oh, obviously it was all political. Um, th there had been huge um, uh, opposition or huge criticism of the rescue of Bear Stearns in March and the rescue of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac or the government takeover just a week before Lehman Brothers. And uh, many people think it's obvious that the uh, leaders of the Treasury and the Fed uh, just weren't willing to um, uh, take the political heat of another rescue. 
Um, there's a variation on it, it was all a political story, which I've heard a number of places, which is the, the sacrificial lamb story, or that somebody had to fail. Um, since there was so much opposition to rescues, uh, the government and the Fed had to let one institution fail so that everybody would see how disastrous that was so that other firms can be rescued. So, so one columnist said uh, Lehman had to die so Wall Street could live. Um, uh, then there's uh, the economic argument that uh, about moral hazard is the buzzword. Uh, that if we keep rescuing one financial institution after another, uh, then there are incentives for risk-taking in the future, and the Fed wanted to curb that. Um, another explanation, and these are not mutually exclusive, of course, uh, is that many commentators think uh, that Fed and Treasury officials uh, underestimated or, or didn't anticipate just how bad the damage of the Lehman bankruptcy would be, and that maybe if they had foreseen what was going to happen, they would have done something to rescue Lehman. So a rich set of explanations for why the Fed didn't rescue Lehman. Uh, however, uh, if you ask Federal Reserve officials, Ben Bernanke, Tim Geithner, uh, on down, they have a story about why they did not rescue Lehman, and it has nothing at all to do with any of these explanations. Uh, so Ben Bernanke, Tim Geithner, and so on, they insist that they fully knew the Lehman failure would be a catastrophe. They desperately wanted to prevent it. They were not influenced by politics. That was not a factor, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, they, they say they were not especially trying to uh, make a point about moral hazard. Uh, instead, uh, what they say is uh, that they did not rescue Lehman Brothers uh, because they, Federal Reserve officials, uh, did not have the legal authority re to rescue Lehman Brothers. Uh, now, how could that be? Well, um, under the law, specifically Section 13 of the Federal Reserve Act, um, the Fed, uh, in some circumstances, uh, can lend to an investment bank like Lehman Brothers was at the time um, under certain conditions. And the conditions uh, include the requirement that uh, the borrower post uh, adequate or the, 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 ter the somewhat vague legal t term in the legislation is they have to have satisfactory security, satisfactory collateral. And there's some, been some debate about exactly what that means, um, but a rough and ready definition given by the general counsel of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve is uh, if the Fed lends money, we have to be pretty confident we'll get paid back because there's enough collateral put up so that even if we're not paid back, we can sell the collateral and not lose money. Um, and um, uh, uh, repeatedly uh, in the last decade, uh, Fed officials have said, uh, so I have a couple quotations here, a speech from Ben Bernanke in 2009, um, uh, another, I forget, there was speech or testimony in 2010 uh, in, in which he says, uh, the amount of collateral Lehman had was much less than the amount they needed to borrow uh, to stay in existence, so they failed the test of satisfactory security. So it would have been illegal to rescue Lehman Brothers, and even though we knew it would be horrible when they failed, we didn't want to break the law. The Federal Reserve was going to follow the law. Um, uh, Bernanke, Geithner, and, and, and colleagues have continued uh, to say the same thing, uh, ben Bernanke said the same thing in his memoirs. I, I quote that in my book, which came out, uh, I guess, about three years ago. Um, uh, in 2000, that just this past year, commemorating the anniversary, um, uh, Bernanke, Geithner, and Treasury Secretary Paulson have been making uh, appearances together, talking about uh, what happened during the financial crisis, apparently trying to set down what's the official history. Um, and they've said the same thing. In, in fact, uh, today, uh, there is a conference in Washington at the Brookings Institution. It is quite possible that literally at this minute, as I am saying, uh, <laughs> the, the Fed had the authority to rescue Lehman, that one of Bernanke, uh, Geithner, or Paulson is saying, we did not have the authority. Uh, we keep saying that. Uh, you, you can look it up on the Brookings Institution um, uh, website. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. Um, Okay. Um, all right, so getting to the point, uh, the point of my book, the central point of my book is that what 
Fed officials said, have said and are saying at this very moment probably uh, is, is just not correct. Um, I, if you ask the question, why was Lehman Brothers uh, not rescued, we can debate somewhat what the answer is, but what the answer is not uh, is that they were not rescued because the Fed lacked legal authority because Lehman didn't have enough collateral. That story is completely at odds with reality in two related but distinct senses. Uh, the first is that if you actually look at the decision making going on in real time, when the Fed was debating what should we do, what will happen if Lehman Brothers fails, what will happen if we rescue Lehman Brothers, they were looking at various economic and political effects uh, that a rescue or a failure might have. There was no discussion about uh, do we have the legal authority. There was no attempt to estimate Lehman's collateral. That was an idea that came up after the bankruptcy when they were obviously thinking how will we explain what we did. Uh, but the second point is that at this point uh, there is enough evidence to actually do what the Federal Reserve could have but did not do right before the bankruptcy, which is to make estimates of how much money Lehman needed to borrow and look at their balance sheet for what assets they have and ask, do they have enough collateral to borrow uh, the amount of money they need? And the answer is yes. And uh, if the Fed had looked at, at that, uh, they, they would have found out the answer is yes. All right, now maybe I sound a little opinionated. Why do I think I know all these things? Uh, why am I right, um, and um, uh, why do I think I know more about it than Bernanke, Paulson, and Geithner? Um, well, the, the, the answer is that there is a lot, there's a tremendous amount of hard evidence on these subjects. Uh, so one thing I want to advertise, in addition to my bo own book, uh, is the work of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission and also uh, the work of Anton Velukas, uh, the examiner appointed by the bankruptcy court in the Lehman case. Um, uh, each of these entities had huge investigations with tens of millions of dollars, scores of lawyers and accountants, and most important, subpoena power. Um, uh, and actually both of them have very user-friendly websites. So if you finish your pizza and the lecture drags on, uh, or, or you think, you know, should I really trust what this guy is saying or not, get out your phone, put in FCIC, and in, in three minutes you'll be reading not only all the internal financial documents from Lehman Brothers about exactly what assets they had, exactly how much cash they were losing, you'll also be reading the emails that Federal Reserve officials were sending to each other on September 14th and the Lehman Brothers executives were sending to each other. So, so many wise people have said, well, you know, based on my understanding of how the world works, this must have been what was happening. Surely the Fed had this in mind or that in mind or this was the reason. You don't really have to be very wise or speculative because you can just look on your cell phone and, and see what people were saying in emails. So, um, you know, if I sound like I have my mind made up uh, about what really happened, uh, it's because there really is a lot of hard uh, evidence. Um, now, um, and any, anybody want to stop me at this point? Questions or comments? Or Yes. Uh, I, I would agree completely with your conclusion on the legal um, side. At the time of the crisis, um, a lot of the uh, Federal Reserve internal lawyers in the New York Fed were calling me to get my views, and uh, we discussed it with a number of them. And not a single one of them felt they, they lacked legal power. And uh, in terms of the reasons, um, at least there are two reasons advanced based on what you've said. Well, one is not quite on the list, and that's the constructive ambiguity. They want to preserve it, which goes to the moral hazard. But the other was that, and this is from Harvey Miller, who was the head bankruptcy partner at Wild Gottschall, that was Lehman's counsel. And he said that all the Fed people there, they were just all through Lehman, they essentially concluded that if there were a Lehman bankruptcy, as, he, as Harvey put it, it would be front page on day one, second page on day two, and like 20th page on day three, and then it would disappear. Um, and Harvey 
completely disagree with that, but that was the Fed's view. That's right. Yeah, actually, I, I, I met Harvey Miller, the bankruptcy superstar who unfortunately is now uh, deceased, and who actually, I, I quote very extensively from his testimony uh, in the book, and he actually was you know, very, I think he was very angry at what the government did to his client and argued was, he, he also had some good wisecracks. He, he uh, I think he said this publicly, I, he also said to me that uh, Henry Paulson's memoirs should be in the fiction section of the bookstore. <laughs> and I'm not sure, I think probably the part of the memoirs about, you know, growing up wherever you grew up is probably true. But I, you know, I think <laughs> other, other parts though, uh, Harvey Miller may have a, have, have a point. Um, um, yeah, that's right. I think I agree with you and Harvey Miller and others that they that they under, that they they may have time to get into this. They they did a number of measures uh, that they thought would um, uh, bring calm to the markets, and um, uh, it, it didn't it didn't work out. Um, uh, okay. All right. So uh, we'll see how much time I have to get through this. Uh, and again, I'd rather have a lively discussion than get through every single thing. Um, so brief refresher on what happened, uh, then trying to hit the nail on the head about, uh, yes, Lehman did have enough collateral uh, to borrow the money it needed, so a rescue was feasible. The, the third point is important also. Um, people often say, well, the Fed decided to let Lehman fail, or the Treasury decided to let Lehman fail. That actually suggests a more passive role than what actually happened. It was not just the case that the Fed and the Treasury stepped aside and Lehman failed. In the days before the bankruptcy, Fed uh, officials actually took affirmative actions. Uh, once they decided that Lehman needed to go bankrupt, um, th they took actions to make sure that happened. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, uh, then as far as that's all about what are the, again, establishing that's not the case that they were constrained by legal authority not to rescue them. Then talk about the question of, well, uh, what is the explanation for their actions? And I'll talk about uh, both the real time evidence and then what Fed officials have said afterwards. And, uh, and, there's, the theme is there's a big difference between what Fed officials say afterwards and what they were saying in real time. Um, and um, in real time, you know, I may or may not get to this in detail, in the end I come down largely on the side it was all political. And, and, and this is not at all original for me. Many people uh, have said, obviously, uh, the, um, the, the Treasury and the Fed uh, didn't want to get all the political heat that, that they would have gotten. Um, but everything that I've read is, con is consistent with that. Um, uh, also with, um, apropos of the last comment, uh, that, that the, the Fed hoped or maybe had some wishful thinking that there were ways that they could contain, uh, contain the economic damage. So in the end, I think it came down to a trade-off between something that was economically risky but might be contained if Lehman failed versus the certainty of a public relations, a political disaster, if they rescued Lehman, um, and so the politics uh, won out. In your research, was there any evidence that they considered the equivalent of the miracle transformation of Goldman Sachs to a commercial bank for Lehman? Or was Morgan Stanley, Goldman later, I guess, when they were, had insta oh, virtual instantaneous conversions to, to charters that would have made them depository, regulated institutions? So, okay, so, so a narrow and a broad answer, the narrow answer, as discussing with somebody earlier today, in the summer of 2008, Lehman executives went to the New York Fed and said, hey, how about we become a bank holding company? And the New York Fed said, that's kind of a, you know, kind of a zany idea. Uh, we, don't, we don't think you should. Actually, one thing that they said, which actually was not a stupid argument at the time, is, well, if we make a big announcement that you're a bank holding company, that'll be a signal that there's something wrong with you, you know, why don't we try other things. Um, it, more broadly, um, um, things changed a lot. So um, things changed a lot after the Lehman bankruptcy. Uh, I actually, like a lot of people, give the Fed and the Treasury a lot of credit for 
at least realizing on September 15th that what they had decided September 14th was not working out very well and shifting course so that actually it was the next day, September 16th, when they uh, rescued, um, uh, rescued uh, AIG. So, so Barney Frank, the Dodd-Frank bill, uh, you know, has this uh, joke about September 15th should be declared National Free Markets Day because on September 15th, the Fed decided to let markets work, and then on September 15th, 16th, they said, only kidding, and they rescued AIG. <laughs> but, um, uh, but I think, but, but generally, they got much more flexible, much more creative on a whole range of things about what's allowable collateral, can we become bank holding companies, can we do other things. Um, I think for the good reason that they saw that we were headed for the 1930s or worse, and, and at least, so, so I think in, in the big scheme of things, I think you know whether they did a good job or a bad job or it's a happy or a bad story depends on what you compare it to. I, I think with um, if they had acted more, if they had acted more decisively a day before they did, we might have avoided a lot of the recession. If they had waited a couple of days later than they did to step in after, say, AIG had failed, you know, we might be having uh, something as bad as the 1930s. So, uh, the glass is half empty or half full. Um, all right. So, uh, very briefly because um, you know, many of you know this to varying degrees. Um, so there were the big five investment banks at the beginning of 2008, uh, which I list there. And um, one thing I want to stress is that w what happened uh, to all five of the investment banks was quite similar. They, in retrospect, all made similar kinds of mistakes. Um, they all got into trouble. They were all faced with the threat of bankruptcy. There were dramatically different outcomes, primarily because of different uh, government and Fed responses at different points in time. Um, but and I think this, in retrospect, is actually pretty well understood. Why do these investment banks all get into trouble? And the story has three parts. Uh, number one, uh, they made risky bets on real estate. They bought these mortgage-backed securities. They had commercial real estate development projects and so on during the real estate bubble. Uh, it, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, these were imprudent investments. They lost a lot of money. Uh, number two, uh, the business model of the time in investment banking was to operate with very high leverage or very low amounts of equity. So you didn't have to lose that much on your real estate investments as a percentage of your assets before your equity started getting close to zero, and people started to say, uh, you know, uh-oh, maybe this firm's going to go insolvent or not be viable. And then, you know, the third and fatal part of the story is that the business model relied heavily on very short-term funding, on lending from other financial institutions, uh, often overnight or with very short maturities, which had to be rolled over again and again and again. So uh, once there was the real estate crisis and counterparties, Fidelity Mutual Funds, started worrying about uh, maybe Lehman Brothers is going to go bankrupt, they said, why don't we cut off our short-term lending to Lehman Brothers because we don't want to be messing around lending money to an institution that might go bankrupt. And so what we had was essentially a bank run, um, you know, a modern version, not with depositors lining up at the bank to withdraw their money, but with financial institutions that are providing and rolling over overnight loans saying we're not going to roll over the loans anymore. Um, all right, the, in the chronology, um, the first of the institutions to get in trouble was Bear Stearns in March. Um, it was J.P. Morgan Chase stepped in and saved the day and purchased uh, Bear Stearns after the Fed agreed to create Maiden Lane LLC uh, to buy $30 billion of real estate a assets that Bear Stearns owned that J.P. Morgan Chase didn't want. So that was the, the first uh, bailout, which led again to this intense uh, political criticism. Um, at the same time, or, or right after that, the Fed said, we don't want what happened to Bear Stearns to happen to other investment banks, so let's create the primary dealer credit facility uh, with the, whose purpose will be 
um, uh, to lend money against good collateral if other investment banks get in trouble so they're not uh, driven out of business by runs the way Bear Stearns is. Um, things actually calm down a little bit over the summer. I discuss in some detail what happened, but basically it was exactly a, 10 years ago that uh, everything uh, blew apart. So September 7th, uh, uh, the government took over Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, um, and then um, uh, that was a Sunday, and, and, and then the following week uh, was when, and basically in three days, September 10th through 12th, um, uh, there was a run on Lehman Brothers, meaning basically uh, the, the, the primary part of it being that the mutual funds and commercial banks and other investment banks that had been doing overnight lending, when Lehman said, showed up and said, okay, time to roll over our overnight loans, the answer was no, give us our cash back. And, and they ran out of cash. Um, so actually, September 12th, 10 years exactly, uh, uh, to the day today was a Friday. That was Lehman's um, last day in business. And with all these other institutions demanding their cash back, they ended the day with $1.4 billion in cash, which uh, in investment banking circles is approximately zero. Um, and you know, it was clear you know, on Monday morning at 9 a.m. they were due to pay somebody $5 billion. They only had 1.4, so it was clear they were not gonna be able to open for business on Monday. Uh, so then there was the famous Lehman weekend, uh, meetings at the New York Fed, again, you know, very briefly, um, uh, on Saturday, September 13th, uh, a sigh of relief as it appears uh, that Barclays, the British bank, has agreed to buy Lehman. There was a complicated deal in which it was a little bit like the J.P. Morgan Chase Bear Stearns deal that first Lehman had to get rid of some assets. In this case, the Fed twisted the arms of a consortium of, of all the big Wall Street firms, uh, Citi, Goldman, Credit Suisse, and so on, that they were each going to put up a few billion dollars to help finance these unwanted assets. So actually, uh, the Fed was, was not going to be involved in that. But they had the deal with the consortium, they had the deal with Barclays, and then very dramatically on Sunday morning, September 14th, uh, the deal was vetoed by uh, British regulators. And um, I discuss in gory detail in, book, in the book the technicalities of what it was the British regulators objected to and the debate over whether with a few more days those technicalities might have been worked out and the Barclays deal could have proceeded. But in any case, um, as of the middle of the day, uh, September 14th, um, suddenly the Barclays deal wasn't there and, um, um, and, and, and this is where uh, Harvey Miller, who was mentioned before, is quite eloquent and angry in saying, you know, the Fed called us down and said, uh, okay, you guys have six hours to file a bankruptcy petition. And I, so I am, you know, not, not an expert in bankruptcy law, not a lawyer, but my understanding is that best practice in bankruptcy law is you take more than six hours to pre prepare your first day motions or whatever, and that if you're the, by far the largest bankruptcy in U.S. history, you might even take a little extra time. So, um, so you know, this helps understand why, uh, you know, it was so, um, you know, uh, so catastrophic and um, uh, uh, disorganized, I'm not finding the right word, uh, when, when they suddenly declared bankruptcy. Also on September 14th, um, some sigh of relief that Merrill Lynch, which was also in trouble, was acquired by Bank of America, um, uh, the Federal Reserve gave Lehman very stern instructions. We want that bankruptcy petition filed by midnight. Uh, they missed by an hour and three quarters. Um, uh, their London broker dealer was due to open at 9 a.m. Uh, in London, which of course is 4 a.m. in New York. So they didn't, um, you know, with no money, so it was cut pretty close. Um, and then again, um, it, it took a day and a half for Fed and Treasury officials, I think, to their credit, uh, to realize we have a problem here, we've got to dramatically change course, and there was the AIG rescue. Oops, uh-oh. Okay. <coughs> and then, I, you know, just a minute, then all sorts of bad stuff happened. Um, 
a credit crunch, plunging stock prices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, a uh, big recession. Again, if we have time or afterwards, I'd be happy to debate the counterfactual history of how much less severe would the recession have been if Lehman had been rescued. Now, notably, um, Goldman Sachs, so, so Bear Stearns was acquired by Bank of America, uh, Lehman declared bankruptcy, Merrill was bought by, by better say, whatever I got. The first three were dealt with somehow. There, there were uh, two of the big five left standing, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. They both ultimately survived um, due to a number of things. Uh, they, you know, uh, Goldman Sachs was able to get $5 billion from Warren Buffett uh, at a key point in time. There was ultimately the TARP help. Uh, there was the bank holding company status. There were a bunch of things. Um, but a large part of it was Federal Reserve aid. So the primary dealer credit facility, and we'll see how many details I get to, which was not opened up to Lehman uh, enough for Lehman to borrow the money it needed, was opened very wide for Goldman and Morgan Stanley. And in my reading of history, that was essential uh, for them to survive. Um, at, at one point in uh, the fall of 2008, Morgan Stanley made a public announcement, if you don't have to worry about us, we have lots of liquidity. Look, we have $50 billion of cash sitting right here. We don't have a problem. That was true. They had $50 billion of cash. They had borrowed $100 billion of cash <laughs> for the Fed. So uh, absent the Fed uh, uh, help, they uh, would have had a problem. OK. Um, you know, unless anybody, again, feel free to interrupt. But forging ahead to the main point, now, he, here, the devil is in the details, and I have a lar large part of the book looking very carefully. And again, because of these in investigations that, that gathered what would normally be internal documents for all these financial institutions, you know, we can track day by day how many repos rolled or didn't roll for Lehman, what assets they had. And, and, and you know, there's some guesswork involved, but it can be pretty educated guesswork. And um, actually, I realize I haven't... The numbers are now 84 billion and 114 billion, um, but um, but but uh, basically um, Lehman seems to have needed about so so if you so AIG needed actually 85 billion dollars initially, <coughs> well over 100 billion dollars ultimately it borrowed from the Fed. Um, uh, Morgan Stanley's borrowing uh, peaked at 107 billion. Lehman, I think, would have needed 80-something billion, plus or minus. Um, they had well over $100 billion of assets that they could have pledged as collateral under the normal rules of the primary dealer credit facility. So even with more than the usual haircuts on collateral in this kind of transaction, uh, they could have borrowed enough. Now, I, again, uh, you don't necessarily... You're not, it, it might be hard to just take this on, at face value. The, the book goes through the numbers. I, I think, though, there also is a basic reason why it should make sense to you that they had enough collateral, which is, again, the primary reason they lost cash, not the only reason, but the primary reason, uh, was that they had their short-term lending did not roll over. That short-term lending consisted uh, almost exclusively of repurchase agreements which one, some of you know what that is, some of you don't, basically means collateralized loans over it. So Lehman would borrow $100 and pledge a security worth $105 to Fidelity Funds or whoever is providing the cash. Um, if when repos don't roll over and you have the primary dealer credit facility, that problem is easy to solve. The whole idea of the PDCF was if uh, Fidelity Fund says, we no longer want to take your $105 of collateral, give us our $100 of cash back. Lehman could take that to the Federal Reserve, and the Federal Reserve, as lender of last resort, according to both the principles established by Walter Badgett in the 19th century and the Federal Reserve Act, uh, the Federal Reserve could have stepped in and um, taken the collateral and provided the cash. and. Uh, and with the collateral would not have uh, subjected itself to significant risk. Um, okay. Any, please. 
The one question that uh, I'm reminded of was the concern about the quality of the collateral, given the fact that so much of it was uh, uh, um, mortgage-backed securities and CDOs, etc. Now, was that uh, a factor that, that worried that, that they couldn't just turn around with 105 and take it to the, the uh, credit facility? N not really. So there's been a lot of debate about questionable assets that Lehman had and how much do they overvalue those assets. And I discuss this in the book. Those assets that were people questioned were actually different from the assets that were used as collateral. So the, the, the big question marks were about... Um, uh, things like commercial real estate development and uh, private equity uh, and some things along those lines that were very hard to value and probably overvalued. Um, the collateral, so we're talking here about the standard collateral in the repo market, which was securities of varying credit ratings, um, but with sort of prices which were established by the clearing banks and, and haircuts, which were adjusted if it was more risky, less uh, liquid collateral. So basically, um, the kind of lending the Fed needed to do was both the kind of lending that was going on in private markets all the time, and that also they did that the Fed did for um, uh, did for um, uh, other institutions, um, uh, and and also, well, so yeah, so so I think. Um, that's the answer to that. Um, actually, there's another related point which will come up in just a minute. So, all right, but, okay, so so it wasn't merely that the Fed just passively said, you know, leave us alone, we don't care what happens to Lehman Brothers. They, they um, took action. So again, actually, uh, Andrew Ross Sorkin's book, Too Big to Fail, actually, I, I've, I've heard some economists sort of put it down a little bit of, oh, that's you know, that's popular, it's based on unnamed sources, I don't know. I, one thing we learned from Andrew Ross Sorkin's book is if, it's to, if, if he's to be, to be believed, uh, Timothy Geithner and other top officials use a lot of really foul words and bad language and when they get in stressful situations, and that's played up a lot in the book. And, you know, so for scholars like all of us, you know, that's not what we care about. But, but actually, I think it... Had, you know, since the book was written, other things have come out, you know, testimony of various people, of various documents, and, and it's led me to, everything fits with what, I, I, so actually I've come to believe that Andrew Ross Sorkin, what he says is basically, uh, is basically um, true, uh, pretty correct. Um, shoot, how did I get onto that? Um, well, okay, so, some, so some of this, some of this is, is, is in his book. Um, 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 all right, so, so, so what the Fed did is, well, this whole thing is very complex. Uh, so first of all, the famous Lehman bankruptcy petition was a bankruptcy petition filed by something called Lehman Brothers Holdings, Inc., which was a holding company uh, which had lots of different subsidiaries. Um, uh, most of the subsidiaries of Lehman Brothers Holding uh, also uh, filed bankruptcy petitions or other kinds of insolvency proceedings were started in different countries. Um, but, but one important part of Lehman Brothers uh, did not um, go bankrupt. Um, and that was something called Lehman Brothers Incorporated, LBI as opposed to LBHI, which was Lehman's broker dealer um, in New York. Um, so one sort of not very well-known, slightly ironic fact about the crisis is that when the Fed was saying, we're not bailing out Lehman Brothers, they were actually lending $28 billion to uh, Lehman's broker-dealer. And they'd actually been quite clear about this. They, they thought that they didn't, that, that, um, they didn't want the broker-dealer uh, to, to suddenly cease business, that that would be very disruptive to the financial markets. Um, they hoped that if they could, it, it could be kept going for a while, that even if the rest of Lehman Brothers failed, maybe that wouldn't be so bad. Again, that didn't work out. Um, uh, so they lent $28 billion to um, the New York broker-dealer. Um, now, so Lehman, like again, all the big investment banks, had a big broker-dealer in New York and a big broker-dealer in London. 
So for Lehman, it was Lehman Brothers International Europe, LBIE. So when the Fed said, and, and, and there were runs or liquidity crises at, at both of the broker dealers. So when um, uh, the Fed said, we'll lend money to LBI in New York, uh, Lehman said, well, that's great. You know, our friends LBIE in London also need money. And the Fed said no to that. Um, and they also said, and I think I'm meeting somebody, I need to find a good bankruptcy attorney about the Fed's excuse. They, they, uh, the Fed said also, you, none of the money we lend to LBI can be transferred in any way, shape, or form to LBIE to help its liquidity crisis. And there was some complicated thing about bank bankruptcy, some ex reason they gave, which I can't make heads or tails of. Um, um, uh, so so the, the part of Lehman that, that, that directly failed, that couldn't meet its bills, was the London broker-dealer. The New York broker-dealer continued. The London broker-dealer, I believe most of the photo famous photographs of people bringing their belongings out in cardboard boxes are in the London uh, office of, of Lehman. Uh, but the holding company uh, guaranteed uh, many of the debts of the London broker-dealer, so when the London broker-dealer didn't pay back the debts and their responsibility, the holding company, which had no cash, so they also decided... Um, um, I actually... Um, so is, I actually... I, I talked to one former Lehman brother person who, who was saying... Um, I, uh, you know, so, so, that, so there was no, we didn't have any cash to operate. Uh, so the Fed told us, you have to declare bankruptcy. Um, we should have, maybe we should have, said this Lehman person, you know, played hardball and said, um, we're going to open for business, whether we have money or not. Um, you better give us money or there. So, so there, there, there could have been basically, I think, every, again, I don't understand the finance and law enough, but I think everybody sort of agrees that an investment bank that says we're in business and we have no money to pay anybody, that that leads to unspeakable chaos. So no, so it, was, it, it could have been a matter of, well, so basically the, the Fed said, you've got to declare bankruptcy. Lehman said, you've got to lend us money. And, and Lehman, the Lehman Board of Directors blinked first and filed a bankruptcy petition. Um, now, now so, so again, uh, the problem though was a London broker dealer, um, uh, so, so basically, all, a, a week again. All you know, the crises were always Sunday night. So on Sunday night, uh, September twenty-first, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley were in trouble uh, in both New York and London. And at that point, um, uh, the Fed said, "We're going to open up the PDCF to London broker dealers as well as New York broker dealers." So there are different ways to look at it. Lehman could have survived if they treated. Um, uh, the whole LBHI, the same way they treated LBI, the broker dealer, Lehman could have survived if, if the Fed had treated Lehman's London unit the same way it treated the Goldman and Morgan Stanley London units uh, a week later. Um, all right, so, so again, the Fed did put up $28 billion. If they'd, if they'd upped it to 80 something billion dollars, I estimate that would have been uh, enough to keep the whole institution going. What would have the, happened in the long run to Lehman? Again, we're into counterfactual history where uh, it's very hard to know. So possibilities include uh, maybe things could have been worked out with the British regulators about their esoteric objections to the Barclays acquisition, and that could have uh, gone forward. Maybe that wouldn't have happened. Um, uh, but Lehman could have, like AIG, like other firms, um, restructured itself, done things to address its problems, weathered the crisis and survived. Maybe not. Uh, maybe uh, Lehman um, uh, would have had... Uh, and, and, and this is... Um, actually, th this is what Harvey Miller said to me a few years ago, and, um, and Alan Greenspan, I think, is famous for saying this, uh, you know, maybe no financial institution is too big to fail, but there are financial institutions that are too big to liquid, liquidate in six hours. So, <laughs> so, so even if uh, e even if Lehman was unviable, uh, there could have been an orderly wind down process. Um, 
on Sunday afternoon, uh, Lehman uh, executives were actually working on a wind down plan. And actually there was a, a question back here and then, um, and, and they basically got the word, um, you know, don't waste your time on that because we have to declare bankruptcy. There was a. Hi, um, I'm, I'm Christina. I'm a business student across the street from business school. Um, and I will be an investment banker as of the summer. So I'm very curious about this topic. Um, do you well, do, do, do better next time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try. Um, do you think that there's an appetite to save banks in the future? Um, if there's like a way to, say somebody like Deutsche Bank hits issues. Something like somebody like Deutsche Bank, for example. For example, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think there's appetite to rescue them? So that's a great question. I don't want to get too too far afield. I, I think that's a, a big source of worry uh, for for two reasons. Number one, what most people have taken away from the financial crisis was we bailed out all those reckless, greedy bankers. And people even, I think, have the view, which isn't, isn't really coherent, that the bailouts caused the crisis and caused the recession. Or, so, so I think you know, there will be huge political opposition to future uh, you know, if, very hypothetically, Deutsche Bank gets in trouble, uh, there will be huge opposition. Uh, also, um, in the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010, the law governing the Federal Reserve was changed to make it actually more difficult legally for the Fed. So somewhat long story short, um, because of the new restrictions in the law, while it was clear, would have clearly been legal for the Fed to rescue Lehman in 2008, if there were a similar thing that happened in the future, it's not so clear it would be legal. Actually, one thing that's a little ironic, again, um, I can't help thinking of what Bernanke, Geithner, and Paulson are literally saying right this minute, um, they, have made, they have made the point that the Dodd-Frank Act has restricted the Fed's powers, and they say that's dangerous, and that part of the Dodd-Frank ought to be rolled back to give the Fed more of a right to rescue financial institutions. I agree wholeheartedly, although from my point of view, it's a little bit ironic that Geithner and Bernanke are stressing the importance of giving the Fed this authority when they didn't use the authority as vigorously as they could have uh, during the crisis. Th there was a. I just, I, I'm sure you're aware of Mr. Richard Fuld, very lovely and charming. Mr. Richard Fuld is taking comfort from your book. He feels vindicated now, which leads, does lead to the question if the Fed had done what you suggest, would that guy have been in charge, continued to be in charge of Lehman? I mean, he, had, he was not a well beloved figure and not a very good, how should I say, not a very good uh, avatar of capitalism. So, I, so this is a bit beside the point, but, I'm, but you know, I'm sure everybody's interested in the human element. So I've never met Richard Fauld. Yeah, I've heard lots of people trash talk him in different ways. <laughs> you know, whether, you know, whether he is a greedy, reckless, you know, capitalist, Wall Street, nasty guy, and Lloyd and 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 Lloyd Blankfein is a saintly, uh, you know, public interested uh, elder statesman. Whether there's such a big difference, I I don't know actually. Um, I mean, I do think so. You know, you know, I I don't have the divinity degree that, that will allow me to pass moral judgment on Richard Fault either way, even if I knew. But um, I, I will say. If you look at his testimony at the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, it was pretty accurate. Um, and it went over very badly. He said, well, we could have done this if the Fed had rescued us. People said, you know, how, how pathetic can you get? He can't even admit that it was his fault. When it, but what he said was, was actually, so, so I may be, you know, maybe the, you know, Richard, you know, Richard Fold fan club is not that large, but I, um, I, I can see why he would be unhappy that he's been portrayed as a villain to the extent he, he has. Well, the real question I was asking also is, if they've made the loans, do you think they have uh -oh. the capacity to, to, to govern compensation, to take, to require remedial action? In other words, they weren't regulators of Lehman. That's really the point, isn't it? I mean, they've, and, the, and the, the blowback on a lot of this stuff has been that no action was taken to do anything to make these 
suffers the wrong work and puts some control on compensation, on discretion, on stuff like that in, that, in these companies? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. And of course, in some of the actual rescues, you know, AIG, the condition was the management has to go. Uh, in, in other cases, again, you know, Lloyd Blankfein is retiring as, uh, you know, a super esteemed elder statesman. I, I don't quite know. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, right, and of course, there is a school of thought that, that it was, you know, good that somebody had to learn a lesson. I mean, I'm, you know, on the one hand, even with Lehman, we didn't learn, it's not as though compensation practices that are necessarily ideal now and that, um, and, and you know, also I think, again, you know, we could discuss it at great length, but, you know, I think the Great Recession could have been um, uh, a lot less severe when you, when you add up the lost jobs, the lost homes, the broken lives, not to be too dramatic, but, you know, that's what it amounts to. Uh, you know, it was an awfully big price to pay to, um, to combat moral hazard. Yes. Uh, my name is Gudrun. Uh, I was one of the leading uh, investigators looking into the crash in Iceland, and uh, which amounted to a third of the, the, the Lehman Brothers collapse. Uh, I just wanted to you or ask you to elaborate a little bit more on on the storyline here. I mean, the story doesn't end at, on the September 15th, and even though you had a 80 billion dollar, 88 billion dollar loan. Uh, are you assuming that Lehman would therefore, the, its exposure to the European banks would not have materialized in a bad way? Are you assuming that, that sort of the whole system would have held uh, as a result of a, a single loan or would the government need, have needed to come into Lehman on, on the operational front? So first of all, I, I actually don't know much about, about Europe to be honest. Um, but, but I think, um, I, 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 again, Every other firm, every other U.S. firm was rescued. You know, I, mean, I think the fact that there was one fail, if there had been zero failures instead of one failure, um, I, I think the panic could have been quite a bit less. I also think there actually might have been ultimately less uh, intervention. So, so one, you know, one little detail of the whole story is that actually over the weekend, so, so AIG was 36 hours behind Lehman Brothers in running out of cash, going to the Federal Reserve, having the Federal Reserve saying, we don't want to rescue you. As of September 15th, there was a tentative deal and there was a term sheet for a deal where a consortium of Wall Street firms were going to lend $75 billion to AIG. It was going to be a private sector rescue. And then, you know, with hours to go, the private sector firm said, you know, this isn't a great environment for us to be doing this. Again, we'll never know. I think if Lehman had not been if Lehman had been rescued, um, there wouldn't have been as much panic. Maybe a, maybe a rescue of Lehman would have made a, a, gov a Fed rescue or government rescue of AIG would not have been necessary. All right. Um, uh, okay, so we're running out of time, but also running out of slides, so it's working out okay. Um, all right, so, so again, um, you know, I... I you know, urge you to look for yourself at all the available records of all the, and again, you know, the memos at, at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York over the summer, the emails, and uh, nobody was talking about, so ben, on, on October 7th, uh, Ben Bernanke made a speech uh, saying we could not rescue them because it was not legal because they didn't have enough collateral. That was when it was first, the idea was first brought up. Um, the there was a lot of discussion about the political effects. Uh, so Andrew Ross Sorkin and many other people quote Henry Paulson as saying, I, I can't be Mr. Bailout. Um, um, I, uh, there's actually, again, the literal email exists of um, Henry Paulson, chief of staff, writing to Henry Paulson's press secretary, uh, which you know, is succinct, but you know, captures, I think, what, what their thinking was. Um, uh, also, I, I think it's, it's quite clear that, that uh, although Branke, Paulson, and Geithner today say we knew it would be a catastrophe, that, that that's not consistent with the real-time record. By coincidence, a regularly scheduled meeting of the Federal Open Market Committee uh, in D.C. was scheduled for September 16th. Uh, in the very brief window of time between 
the Lehman failure, and the AIG rescue. And um, in 2013, five years after the meeting, the transcript was published. I encourage you to go to frb.gov and read it. Uh, no, people were talking about, well, you know, there's some financial strains. You know, let's see what happens. It would be premature to reduce the federal funds rate, given that we're also concerned about inflation. I mean, we read it, you know, read it for yourself. There were a number of people who congratulated Bernanke on, you know, holding the line against bailouts. There's nothing in the transcript about Bernanke saying, oh, no, 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 it's actually going to be a catastrophe. So, you know, read it for yourself. Um, okay. Since the bankruptcy, uh, and I'll, I'll try to stop right at uh, so, so also, if you're all interested, read Ben Bernanke's testimony before the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, where th that's the one place where there was basically sort of hostile cross-examination, where uh, he said, well, they didn't have enough collateral. Well, how do you know? Well, people at the New York Fed researched it. Well, is there some document at the New York Fed that writes that down? Well, I'm not quite sure. It's, you know, it goes on for hundreds of pages. After the hearing, the FCIC was not satisfied with the answers, so they wrote this, uh, a, a letter. With some, so here's a follow-up question. And it, you know, it, it's a little bit of a weird question. Well, I don't know, it says, you, know, you said there was this collateral analysis, provide us uh, you know, the, the analysis, the person who communicated you, the date and place, you know, the way I read this uh, is we really, really, really want you to tell us about this collateral, you know, how you do about the collateral. Uh, Bernanke replied to the questions with, I think it was 12 tiny single space pages of answers. Again, look it up for yourself. The, uh, the relevant response to the question is, is uh, the line there. So anyway, so I think that pretty much speaks for itself. Um, I, I, again, under um, cross-examination by, I hear, I hear that Peter Wallison talked here uh, a few, uh, some time ago. Actually, there's an example, if, if you can multitask, you can read this on the slide. Uh -huh. I'll, I'll give a different example. Both, Bernanke, both uh, Thomas Baxter, New York Fed General Counsel, and Ben Bernanke testified, um, uh, um, Lehman was insolvent, Lehman was gonna fail, um, uh, what's the point of lending them money, throwing away money, if, if everybody knows they're going to fail? Um, uh, we knew they were going to fail. Other people on Wall Street knew they were going to fail. Even Lehman knew they were going to fail. Uh, and, and they quote the minutes of the uh, board of directors meeting on September 14th, when they ultimately decided to declare bankruptcy. And in the board of directors meeting, what Bernanke and Baxter, the Fed officials, quote is a statement saying um, bankruptcy is an ultimate inevitability and a couple things along those lines. So the Fed people say, well, it's an inevitability. Why waste money? If you just read, the, if you, you know, read a couple more sentences, they're saying bankruptcy is an ultimate inevitability because we're out of cash and the Fed has refused to give us any cash. Um, so citing that as a reason for the Fed not to give them cash just doesn't. Um, so um, um, so you don't have to scratch very far below the uh, the surface of, of um, what the Fed officials are saying to see some of the flaws. And I'll stop there. Happy to take questions formally or informally afterwards. So it's one